All right, Tony Gaskins, welcome. I never knew TV. Thank you. Thank <laughs> right. you for having me. All right, cool, man. Um, uh, we want to get right to it. So first question is, right, um, resilience is a very important skill most men don't have. Um, if resilience is not learned in childhood, do you believe resilience can still be learned in adulthood? I do. And I actually believe that it'll be better learned in adulthood than in childhood because when you have to be resilient as a child, you don't necessarily know what you're learning. So a lot of times what we see from grown men who had to be resilient as a child, they are trauma ridden as adults. But when you're an adult and you're forced to be resilient, now you have a better understanding of what you're going through. So now the, the lessons, they mean something, they mean more. So I really didn't have to be resilient as a kid because I grew up in a two-parent home, one home my whole life, three-bedroom three house. So it was comfortable for me. The resiliency for me came as an adult, being kicked off my college football team, you know, getting in trouble, being in the streets, living that lifestyle, almost losing my wife, almost losing my first son. So that is where resiliency was built. So that changed my perspective on it. Um, but in men in general, right? Because too many times we take our unique situation and put it on the next people. Mm -hmm. The average man, like how can you learn resilience if he didn't learn it as a child? He's gonna have to learn it by going through. You, it, it's gonna be, your average man is gonna fail. He's gonna lose a job. He's gonna lose a girlfriend. And so that's where we learn resiliency by understanding that it's really about how you look at the situation. So today we don't have a lot of resilient men because they're looking at the situation like, why did this happen to me? Instead of why did this happen for me? Or looking at it like, this is only building my story. I was talking to a young man who went through a tough situation and <clears throat> he's being forced to uproot his life. And he was in a woe is me type of mentality. And what I told him is, pretend you are watching a movie and you're the main character and what has happened to you just happened in this movie. If you're sitting on the outside looking in, what do you want to see this character do? If this character, the main character goes and starts getting high all day, starts getting drunk, starts beating on his girlfriend, how are you going to feel? You're going to sit there and you're going to be like, man, come on, get it together. Like, come on, man. Like, there's just one bump in the road. Like, okay, you, you got kicked out of college. Like, what's next? Like, turn this into something. And when we take and we take that approach, that's how a man builds resiliency by, instead of looking at it like the world is against him and hating women, that's what, in my space, that's what I see. Most men getting their heart broke today. They, they go for a woman, the woman cheats on them, and then they hate women. Instead of letting it make them wiser, letting it make them stronger, letting them change, make them change how they choose their woman, they instead join the woman haters club. And by doing that, you don't build resiliency. You become a victim. I'm glad you said that because the key to resilience is perspective. Mm -hmm. How you view a certain event, you know, and too many times we have, we people view events as uh, personal one. It's like a personal attack on them. And also it's just like, they don't see the lesson to be learned. And it's not an end of the world. We live in an end of the world vibe. Anything mm -hmm. happens, it's the end of the world with you, you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's the thing, too, is where a lot of times we don't realize it, but our personal experience is not always the same as other people's experience, but principles, the principles are the same. So even if a man went through, or a woman, for example, my wife, she went through a lot as a child, meaning a lot of evictions. Well, that didn't necessarily make her resilient 
because she couldn't process what was happening. Instead, it more so made her fearful of change. And so whereas because I was in one home, it makes me open to moving to Europe because I've been in one place. Whereas because she was moved around, she wants stability. So the principles remain the same is that as a child, we didn't fully understand what was going on. But those seeds were planted and the fruit of it happens to us in our adulthood. And so that's where I believe it's important that we start to identify as adults those trauma points, those pain points, and really evaluate it with adult wisdom instead of just continuing to be a victim to what we've gone through and what we've experienced. And understanding that my experience is no different than your experience, even if your experience is totally different, the principles and the lessons and the message, that's the through line, that's the common denominator, which goes back to like what you said, perspective. All right, um, I know you're a church man, right? You grew up, you grew up in the church. <laughs> grew up in the church All right. from um, the age of six. Is the black church equipped to deal with issues plaguing black people in today's society, uh, specifically economically, mental health, and family? And to be honest with you, right now, don't get yourself in trouble with your church people. Oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> to, to be honest with you right now, the, the black church is not really, and not just the black church, it's almost any church, is almost not really equipped to deal with what we're being played with in society because when a human being earns a living, it changes for most people from a purpose to a profession. And when your livelihood depends on people feeling good about their situation so that they will open their wallets, their pocketbooks, it, it waters down the message. <laughs> Sorry to cut you, right? Me and my brother had this conversation all the time in the sense that um, I went to church when I was younger. I went to Pentecostal church, right? Me church, too. You know. Me too. But um, what I noticed is specifically, I remember my wife's friend had a Christian in, in, in Maryland. And I will say the pastor was actually teaching life via like things you can actually apply and improve yourself. But the place was empty. I've been to other places where there's hooting and hollering and nothing's being said and it's packed. So I need you to repeat what you said again <laughs> for those listening. Right, right. What's going on? Yeah, that's the thing is like today pastors are focused on paying their bills. They focus on getting the boat. They focus on getting the plane, getting the bins. And so they want, they don't want to disrupt your demons. They don't want to light a fire under you. They want you to come in and feel comfortable. So that's why we got cursing pastors today because if you curse and you coming from the streets and you curse, the pastor want to curse to make you feel comfortable instead of making you feel like, oh man, I Hold should. Hold on, pastors are like cursing in church? Yeah, we got cursing. In the pulpit? Yeah, we got cursing right. pastors. And then, and then, not necessarily in the pulpit, but pastors who curse like in their day-to-day -day life, on, on their podcast interviews, you know, and it's pastors that's promoting it and pushing it as the cursing pastors. And it's really what they're saying they're doing is they're saying that they want to relate to who they're trying to reach. And that's a flawed belief because I can't reach a crackhead by doing crack. And excuse me for the term, but a drug addict, I'm, if I sit down and do drugs with a drug addict, it, he or she is not coming off the drug because I'm relating to them. So if I'm living in a way that resembles the life of the person I'm trying to reach and they need to come out of that way of living or thinking or behaving, then I'm reinforcing what they're doing and that's what's wrong with the church today is we got too many feel good prosperity messages when no one is prospering but the pastor. And the parishioners, they're going because they're miserable in their life, they're going for a motivational speech or they're going for entertainment. And the church has become, in, in the large part, has become reality TV. 
So a lot of people are sitting in the church and patting themselves on the back for not watching junk reality TV, but they're watching a junk play on the stage in church because the pastor is spitting in his hand and rubbing it in a man's face, trying to emulate Jesus healing the blind. Well, that's more intriguing than watching reality TV. We watching, we sitting in the congregation watching soft porn watching man-on-man -man soft porn. So it's like they're turning the church into a uh, theater and it's becoming a mockery. So that's why I've created, so to speak, my church outside of the church, meaning I'm on YouTube every day and I'm preaching, but it's without taking up tithes and offering. It's without the four walls, but I'm sharing the word of God and as it relates to whatever topic I'm talking on. And more people, so my church now has nearly 500,000 people in it on YouTube because I'm bringing the unadulterated truth in a very real and raw way that's still relatable. And the people who get mad, they just stop watching the videos for a little bit or they unsubscribe, but then they email me a year later and say, you made me mad. You was telling too much truth but I'm back now, I'm ready to receive it. I have two questions uh, based on something you said. In regards to the pastors, right, is it the people going to church that's forcing the pastor to change just to keep people in there? Or is it just the pastors now have been so uh, immersed in materialism that they just kinda, their main focus is not teaching, but making sure the money comes in. Exactly. They focus on the money coming in. And the thing about it is, is if you offend people, like if you take as a pastor and you offend a group of people with the word of God, like let's say you offend the rappers who donate $10,000 just to floss and flex the devil's money. Some of these pastors getting tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of dollars from an athlete, from a rapper, from an executive, where this, these people may be, these people may be living in fornication. These people may be doing threesomes, foursomes, living crazy. But now the pastor is beholden to these donations. And if they speak on the ills of fornication, if they speak on using profane words, and mix in profanity with what's sacred, which is the Holy Spirit. If they speak on this, now they're offending a whole group of people. And they're running a business. They're not running a purpose-based ministry. So now imagine having a business and you deliberately cut out 30% of your income any almost any business have even a 20 percent drop in income may go out of business so that's why the pastors now are so many of them and of course it's not every one of them and that should be common sense but when you're speaking like this people always oh you can't speak for everybody and it's like i like to make that known not talking about everyone but the ones we're being promoted online the ones we're seeing go viral that's what 99% of them are doing. Uh, this, the last one I had about the church was, I'm pretty sure you observed this going to church. Why do people go to church for decades without experiencing any change in their life? And that right there is, that's, that's where we mess up at because they're going and they feel that by going, that's doing the work. They feel like they say sitting in church <clears throat> doesn't make you a Christian any more than sitting in the garage makes you a car. And that's the issue is I deal with that in life coaching. People will come to me and have a conversation with me, but don't go do the work. And so they feel like the conversation was the work. And so with a lot of people in church, 
they feel like going to church was the work. Not realizing you got to go to church, but then go do the work. So go change your situation and come out of that fornication. Leave out of there and stop cursing. Leave out of church and stop gossiping. Stop backbiting. Stop being envious. Stop lying. Stop stealing or scamming or cheating. And we just feel like, oh, I went to church. I was washed of, of my sins. So I get to go sin again Monday through Saturday. And I'm going to go back Sunday and be washed again. But I think the modern message of church kind of promotes that idea, right? Because it's like um, you do whatever and I guess you repent prior to dying and you should be good to go. <laughs> right. That's like the main. So it kind of promote that type of psychology. Mm -hmm. Right. And the thing about it is what we fail to realize is that the Bible says God will not be mocked. So God evaluates the heart. So you're not really repenting if you don't go and sin no more. Whenever Jesus forgave somebody, he said, go and sin no more. He didn't say, go and sin tomorrow. Now, we know every man will fall short of the, of the glory of God, but that doesn't mean that you willingly do it. <laughs> Free fall. <laughs> right. That means you falling is different than falling and diving. So we diving into the sin. We diving into it day after day and then claiming repentance. Well, that's not repenting. And so that's the issue and that's the fallacy. But I'm going to tell you, the reason why that exists is because those who are speaking are not living it. So because I'm doing everything that I can to live a righteous lifestyle, the scripture that I focus on from Jesus is the scripture where he says, be perfect as your father in heaven is perfect. So I don't lay my head to rest on the scriptures about grace because people take grace for granted and people abuse grace. I hold to the scriptures that hold me accountable that say be perfect. The scripture that says go and sin no more. That's what the, the scriptures that say if a man lusts after a woman in his heart, he's already committed adultery. That right there is such a big one that that keeps me from adultery because I'm already being told I'm in sin just for lusting. So to not lust is hard enough. So if I'm fighting to not lust, then I'm definitely not going to be lying down with a woman if I'm already convicted just from looking. And so that's our issue with humans is we're not really seeking righteousness. We're seeking grace. We're seeking forgiveness, but we're not seeking change. We're not seeking growth. We're not trying to be perfect. And, and we look down on trying to be perfect, but Jesus said it. All right. In my experience, right, I learned that success is rather boring due to the monotony and the repeatedness needed to be successful at a particular thing. Um, how does people's obsession and addiction to drama pre prevent them? All right, start from the top. How does people's obsession and addiction to drama pr prevent them from having a strong, joyful, loving, supportive, and successful relationship? Mm, that's a good one. You know, you you exactly right. Is we that the reason why they're prevented from it is because they get their high from the drama. See, what people don't realize is that the brain is so sensitive to stimuli. So if you allow peace to stimulate your brain, then you will require peace. But if you go through arguing and yelling, fussing and fighting, the brain also has a release from that. So you can release dopamine in a good way or it could be released in a toxic way. The brain going to have a release regardless. And depending on the stimuli, that's what you tell yourself, this is what I need more of. So once you normalize and you stabilize, meaning you're sidestepping the power struggles and you're avoiding arguments, but you're engaging in discussion 
through healthy communication, your brain gives your body a release into your bloodstream that feels good. It doesn't upset your stomach. And you're like, man, it feel good, like to laugh and joke. But then when a good, when, when a conversation, when a topic comes up, we able to sit down and talk about it. And I'm able to express myself, but then I'm also humble enough and willing to listen. So we having this back and forth and I'm actually hearing you. I'm listening to you, not just to react, but to respond in a positive manner, meaning without yelling, screaming, cursing, name calling, victim blaming, or playing the victim. So now we actually moved the ball down the field. We got somewhere and I got a release from that. Whereas if the couple is screaming and yelling, arguing, cursing, calling names, playing the victim, victim blaming, victim shaming, now you get a release from that as well. And that's why people say they talk about makeup sex. They talk about break up the makeup because of the highs and lows, because of the release. And that's why people struggle to have healthy relationships. And it's not just relationships between a man and a woman. Friendships the whole nine. Man. Exactly. Drum. Drum. I see this with mother and daughter a lot. I see it with mom and daughter, like back and forth, bickering. Best friends today, enemies tomorrow. <laughs> that happens like that. That that mom hurt is it, different than dad hurt because a lot of times the dad hurt is from the dad being absent. No interaction. Yeah, and in, and a lot of times the mom hurt is from the mom being present. And, but the mom operating from her pain. So she's causing pain on her daughter because her daughter looks like her, sounds like her, and has her same body parts. And then mom may actually cater to her son or she may abuse her son because he's younger than her, weaker than her, and she's been hurt. And so even in that relationship, which is the relationship that we first should focus on, before the intimate relationships because our intimate relationships oftentimes are dictated by our family and personal relationships. And so that's really what it is. And the world reinforces it through reality TV. Do you, um, I hear online, I'm not too deep into the, the couples thing because it kind of disgusts me. So, <laughs> no, seriously. Why man. does it disgust you? I don't think... Um, there's too many people that's not qualified talking about stuff. You get what I'm saying? Like, did you see me talk about that? I saw it. I saw you. <laughs> no, I saw you burn him out the other day with that. It's very true. My man got defensive, but because I remember the part where you asked him, um, "Are you married?" Then it's all this talking, but you're not married. You get what I'm saying? There's too much theory. Mm -hmm. That's the problem. We don't have people with actual experience. Mm -hmm. And I think that because uh, it's a free for all online, and it's it's kind of negative, and a lot of people cater towards that and they're getting all the support but it's very detrimental because like you don't know what you're talking about uh -huh. i think you mentioned something too like by listening to them you could hear you've never been in a relationship you've never been with a woman for a duration of time uh -huh. it's much yeah. easier to have a bunch of women than one woman that's into you for a decade or numerous years exactly but yeah it's kind of i don't know man it's kind of but you know what though you got a ring on your finger you married so you married so you notice how you're married, so you from north, you in the south working, and you're sitting with me talking with me, and you're not offended by me because you're married, so you know that what I'm saying has some truth to it because you also have experience in a marriage. Well, the gentleman who, these guys who are out here talking, who are not married, they're offended by my truth because they can't relate to it because they have not been in a marriage that has worked. They basically get exposed, bro, at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. You get what I'm saying? Because the things that you're saying, like, the, the, the skill sets that you need, I've been married for 10 years, right? I got a nine-year-old kid. The skill sets that you need to develop and how you have to grow along the way to keep the household in order a lot of dudes never experienced that. So I just think you shouldn't, you know what I'm saying? Like, it's like, 
I played Division One basketball. I'm kind of turned off to a lot of analysts that didn't play the sport. Mm-hmm. You can talk about certain things, but you never had to score with 10 seconds left. You never had to stop somebody. You get what I'm saying? You've mm-hmm. never been in that pressure situation mm-hmm. and delivered. Mm-hmm. So you shouldn't talk about it. You can talk about other things. Mm-hmm. There's a lot of things to talk about, but certain things you shouldn't talk about. Exactly. And see, you get it, and that's why I'm disgusted by the relationship space. And if if God would allow me, I would move on. But I feel like this cup cannot be passed from me because I feel like my voice is needed to bring balance, you know, to bring stability and to disrupt that other side and what they're talking about. So I've been given a, a supernatural strength right now to like produce several videos a day to just be out there fighting and combating the toxicity. And what I notice is, man, um, all right, so this is what I notice, man. Like, there are two things, and tell me if you agree with this. One, I notice fathers who are good fathers don't post a lot of pictures with their children because you're with them every day and it's nothing unique and special to share with anybody. And also with this, this, uh, this marriage thing, it's like there are not enough people with strong, healthy marriages speaking about it because they're doing other things. They're not necessarily in this realm. They're out there, you know, but they, they don't have the platform. And I guess due to the age and the time, you know, and a lot of people do, I guess they talk for their livelihood. So that's what they do all day and they have to bring people in. With a mixture of a lot of miserable people out there, lonely, miserable people who's their audience. It's, it's just like, it's not good, man. <laughs> right, right. And that's the thing. I, I seen a quote one time that said, the deeper a river gets, the less noise it makes. And I kind of changed it to say the deeper a relationship gets, the less noise it makes. So, like, my wife and I, we really have no desire to post couples pictures because we're really living it. And we're not trying to monetize it. We're not trying to brand it because we also understand that the more you promote it, the more attack you invite. And so it's almost like opening your front door and saying, I have jewels and safes full of cash in here. When you overly promote your relationship versus promoting it when you need to. And when I say promoting when you need to, I mean honoring on my wife's birthday, I post her. On our anniversary, we post, you know, things that it is a day that a day of honor, Valentine's or whatever it may be, you will post. I we didn't even post um this Valentine's in twenty twenty three just because it was like it was so watered down. And 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 we actively working on our marriage, you know, seventeen we're going on seventeen years of marriage. And so, you know, we're like, hey, we live in this. I don't we don't wanna be lumped in with the people who just faking. I had a part two to the question, right? I hear a lot of women speak about how they want stability, right? And due to my observation, though, I don't think people actually want stability because they don't understand it. And when they experience stability, it's terrifying to them. Also, it's boring. Have you experienced this working with people? Yes, all the time. It's like, it's another one of those things of it's a concept that they hear the word, but they don't know what it looks like in reality. Because stability means you're not dealing with somebody that's going to be just arguing with you all the time. Someone that wants to engage in arguments. Your stability doesn't mean you're going to be dealing with the bad boy, the tough guy, the guy who turns you on, you know, and all of this to where you just so head over heels. And so a lot of people are seeking this word, but they have fantasized about what that word is. When stability is boring, it is monotonous, and you have to find the joy and the happiness in not arguing. The joy and the happiness in building a friendship with who you're with. And then also stability is more so about emotions and not finances, because finances change from day to day. A person could be, a man could be making 250K and his company goes out of business. He gets laid off. They say, hey, we're going a different direction. We want a new CEO. We want a new CFO. We want a new whatever. 
and he has to go find another job. But the direct jobs are already staffed. So now he has to sit down for a season. It may take him three months. We know in business, a lot of businesses shut down during C-19 because one month with no business bankrupt them. So imagine somebody seeking stability and thinking that it's only financial. And then they go through three months or six months unemployed. Their relationship will implode because they misunderstood what stability meant. When really it's talking about emotional stability. It's talking about even in loss, that man still being able to center himself, gather himself after his breakdown, after his meltdown, gather himself, look himself in the mirror and say, okay, what am I going to do? How am I going to be creative in this situation to still be stable for my family? And cable may have to get cut off. <laughs> you know, lights might be off for 24, 48 hours. You know, water might get be off 24, 48 hours. Like, car might get repossessed. But if he's not putting hands on her, if he's not cursing her out, treating her like a, a stray dog, that's stability. And then on the other side of that, because of the resiliency that is being developed in the midst of that loss, on the other side of that, he will earn double because of the character that was not only revealed, but the character that was continuously built. And so that's really why I'm so big on listening to people who have been in the trenches and not just died in the trenches or suffered in the trenches, but won in the trenches. Because a divorced person can tell us what went wrong in their marriage, but they can't tell us how to make it work because they did not figure out the recipe to make it work. And that's the difference, just knowing who we listening to and the words that we hold it on to, like stability, like good man, good woman, what does that really mean? Um, have we been irresponsible as a culture when we joke about verbal and physical abuse? We definitely have. We definitely have. And it's like a lot of times it's, to, it's because it's so dark. And so we try to water it down or we try to, you know, kind of make it not so serious. But if that's done too much and in the wrong way, it does especially when you think about the person who is listening. And I remember that happened to me years ago. I was doing a video and I was making an example and I was like, now listen, you know, I'm trying to tell you this to spare you, to help you not go through this. If you don't listen and you get in this relationship, you get in this situation and this man go upside your head, then you're gonna be, and a lady, she was in the comments, she was like, Tony, don't ever, speak about you know that in that way and it was the colloquial phrase that i use that triggered her trauma because if she have actually felt that act it hits her totally different than a woman who has never felt that act and so we could talk about that stuff and people who have not gone through it they'll put all the little crying laughing faces and minimize it because they've never experienced it. And so that's what I try to be mindful of and remind myself that if I'm speaking on it, even if I'm using a, a phrase for the sake of YouTube and not saying the A word, you know, A, B, U, what have you, and I use another term that I'm still being intentional and purposeful with it, but we definitely, you, you see it online, just so many jokes and laughs and, you know, even showing videos of it and people like just making light of the situation. There's a part two to the question, right? Um, I once heard you say this in a reference to people who stay in abusive relationships. A person's presence sanctions abuse. Uh, please explain to the viewers what you mean by this. 
What I mean by that is if you reinforce a behavior, it repeats itself. So sometimes people say, well, if you leave, you could lose your life. If you stay, you're also going to lose your life. So the question is, do you want to die standing up or die on your knees? And what I mean by that is you could leave and the person may let you go because they're not actually that person to take your life. But they never thought you would have the strength to walk away. But if you stay, you're reinforcing the behavior, you're feeding the monster, and the monster gets stronger. So the way abuse works, and because I've been in an abusive relationship, when I was 18, 19 years old, I'm playing college football, we were actually in the locker room being taught by our teammate how to abuse our girlfriends. And this was a, a common thing, and it mostly happens, studies show, between the ages of 19 and 24. And it's just young people not knowing how to express emotions or handle their emotions. And you're, in, you're trying to be in love, but you don't know what love encompasses. You don't know what a relationship encompasses. So you're trying to control a human being or change a human being. And whenever you try to control or change a human being, you lose control. And when you lose control, depending on how you express your anger determines what type of abuse you enter into. So for some people it's verbal, some people it's emotional, some people it's financial, some people it's social, some people it's physical. But abuse is abuse. You brought up something. I want to talk about this financial abuse, right? You see this horror and culture we have with this, this social media? It seems like a lot of these women set themselves up for financial abuse. I don't think they know what road they're going down because to be solely dependent on the person and you have no skills and no ability to earn outside of opening up your legs, that's going to get old real quick. I don't think they understand the road that they're going down. And we're, it's a glamorized thing. I know this right now. It's like it's kind of like, what do you call it, like popular escorting or something in a sense. But like it's going to come out of financial abuse, right? Have you noticed this? Yes, yes. And it's something that they say has been from the dawn of time but now with social media it's promoted and so many women are online and they're they're opening their mouth saying he has to make this amount of money not realizing the nature of a man and not realizing that as men we don't value a woman who did not help us make this amount of money she is viewed as a leech, that a man is not going to view a woman in our society, with our media, with our, with the voices that's out there, 99.9% .9 of men will be incapable of valuing and appreciating a woman who did not help him build the wealth he has. He will see her as an opponent, not a teammate. He will see her as a leech, not a supporter. And so she is going in thinking that she's a queen, thinking that she's a princess, and she's going and, oh, I got a man with money. Yeah, that's his money. And they're setting themselves up to be financially abused, meaning the man will give them a nice car, nice purses, nice house, nice clothes, but the moment he's tired of her, he strips her of everything, sends her right back to nothing, bare bones, and he moves on with his life. Or he cheats and plays in her face, and, and she's forced to accept it because she has promoted her lifestyle to all her friends and family. So a lot of women who are being financially abused, they hide their tears. They hide their tears, and they stay in that situation because they're like, I, I prioritize money because I grew up poor or I was lacking. So I prioritize money and I've made this known or I've shown this in so many ways, I can't leave. So they become a slave to the man's money and the man knows that. And it takes a very 
very rare man to have money and not abuse a woman with his money. I really have never met that man. If, if, and so, and that's why I try to express this because I came into money over years, but my wife was with me on ramen noodles, on WIC, government cheese, food stamps, and I was building my business and we were still on food stamps. It came to a point where I had to tell her, hey babe, I'm, I'm building, my name is getting out there. There's a possibility that the person who is processing the food stamps might recognize our name. I say, so we need to get off food stamps. And she was like, oh yeah, that's a good point. We still wasn't where we needed to be, but my I, we still didn't have any money, but my name was going viral on Twitter. And this was like 2010. And I'm like, I don't want that to be out there, so we're gonna have to just kind of make it work. And now, my wife can have anything she wants because she was there when I had nothing. And I, even being a good man, a reformed man, if I was a single man with the financial status that I have now, I wouldn't be able, even my, my client that's out front, he, he's very well off as a coach and he's single. And, he's, and he said his biggest fear is a woman coming to him for his money. And I say rightfully so. Even being a good man, he still fears that. And that's what women don't understand when they make that known and when they put that out there, that they're attracting the wrong type of man. Because even a good man with money doesn't want to hear that a woman has a money requirement for him. <laughs> I want to hear what you say about this one. Um, should broke men date? Should broke men date? Broke men date. Not not that 20. I'm talking about you like, say like after 28. After 28? Yeah, should should a broke date. man date? I don't think so. And, and it also depends on how you define broke. You know, so meaning you don't have your own place. No, he should not be dating because in the maturity continuum, we have dependent, independent, interdependent. So if a man doesn't have his own place, he's a dependent. But in order to be married, he has to be interdependent. But before being interdependent, he has to be independent. So a man's sole focus should be being independent, figuring out a way to earn enough income to pay for a place to stay and to pay for transportation, even if that's the subway, and to pay for his food and his grocery and be able to take care of himself. Lights, water, phone bill, be independent. And it doesn't mean he has to be swimming in cash. It doesn't even mean he has to have an 800 credit score, but he needs to be independent before looking to date because dating costs, because you gotta be able to pay for dinner, you know, pay for the transportation, you know, pay for the outings because it is unfair to be living with somebody and then asking a woman to just do a bunch of free dates walking around the park or just sitting on the phone talking if you over the age of 28 if you over the age of 25 and 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 so what happens is a man who wants to date before he has his own place before he's independent that man can go into a place of being a gold digger for a woman where he's looking for a woman he could live off of it was what the people call a hobosexual. It's like a, it? a hobo. You hobo. know how they say hobo, meaning a homeless person? They call it a hobosexual. It's somebody who is, they're not looking for love, they're looking for help. They're looking for somebody they could live off of. And it, it, there is a large amount of men in our society. And unfortunately, a lot of them are black men because of what we come from and the struggles that we face. And They've been behind the eight ball since a child, 
and they're still behind the eight ball as an adult. And so what they do is they go and they find a woman who has her own. She got her own apartment. She got her own car. And they go live in that woman's apartment and drive her car. And they stay in that place. I could see if you meet and it's an organic connection. So there are exceptions to the rule to where, let's say a man is, he's living with somebody and he's working, meaning he's ambitious, he's making moves, and he meets a woman in that process. And she likes him, his personality, but he has ambition. He's not standing still, he's moving forward. And they're talking and they're building, but it's organic. It's not like he was intentionally out looking for a woman, looking for a wife. Can you hold your thought? I just want to ask you this. Please hold your thought so we can continue after this. It seems men and women struggle with identifying ambition for what I would call, I don't know any other word, but like scamming. You know what I'm saying? Like, I think people are very good at presenting themselves as progressive when they're not doing anything and people get sucked in. Uh -huh. Instead of spending that energy to be the real thing. Yeah. Me, me and my wife was talking about that like last night or the night before. And we were talking about how scammers like could be multimillionaires legitimately yeah. if they use the ingenuity that they're using to scam the government or the ingenuity that they're using to scam other people. Like I have people who steal from my credit cards steal from my debit cards and I'm like how did you I'm holding my card in my hand how did you get my card number and you're spending it five hours away from me like if you're that smart you could get with some developers and create a tech company that becomes worth a billion dollars and that's the thing is like because I would say they got it honest. And what I mean by getting it honest is because of the segregation and the discrimination and because of the lack of perceived opportunity in the black race, that's when people up north and you know from your area like started selling crack, running numbers, all these different hustles. And they're running these hustles because they're saying, I can't go earn what the white man earns. And so from this culture of hustling, and you hustle, you take shortcuts, you get the Benz, you get the BMW, you get all the big gold chains and the big gold rings, and then you get all the, the loose women. So now this has just been passed down from culture to culture from the 60s or whenever. And today, it's the same thing. They're like, okay, I could go work an honest job and I could live off 50% of my income. So I'm basically living like a slave. I'm saving 50%. I could do that for 10 years, buy a property, then flip that property, and then become a owner of 10 different properties like Mr. Johnson. But it's gonna take me 30 years. Or I can go figure out this scam and in 12 months, have a Benz and a Beamer like Ace Boogie. Which route do I want to take as a human? <coughs> and so they take that risk of going to prison, of losing their life, to do a scam. You know what, I, I, want, I wanted to jump back to this uh, woman thing, but I just want to touch on what you just said. You know what happened a lot of time with them? Yes, it's impatience, but it's also confidence. They don't believe they'll be successful long term. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's really a cop out. People don't understand how hustling is a cop out a lot of times. Mm -hmm. The weakest emotion in a man and a woman produces hustlers and scammers. I try to tell people that because I was in the streets. And when I was in the streets, it was for the same thing, a lack of confidence. It was for insecurity. It was for weakness. And when you out there on that side of things and then you come out and you look back, you realize that the real men are the men who avoided crime. 
the real men are the men who had the confidence and the strength to do the right thing even though it wasn't paying off as fast initially. As, as initially as those who were doing the wrong thing. And so all of our gangster rappers are, for lack of a better term, punks. Just meaning scared. They're scared, they're insecure, and they're weak. But we've been tricked as black men, especially, to be afraid of them. So we fear the gangster rappers. We fear the guys who are shooters. We fear the, the hustlers and the thugs. But really, they're the scariest men on the face of the planet. Softest tissue, man. Softest <laughs> tissue. Anyone that's like worked in the school, worked in the prison system or police, they know they saw. They know they saw. Now, I want to be clear, because they're scary, they will shoot you if they have a firearm. They will shoot you. But it's not done out of tough, it's done out of fear. It's you. done out of All fear. Right, it's done right. because they are scared. And that's why we losing so many lives, because of scared people with guns. All right, I want to jump back, right, uh, with the woman thing. Um, all right, so you said there's a large pool of women out there for men to exploit in regards to living with, right? The question I have is, is that I know there's an imbalance between the amount of men and women, but is it a situation where there are two things, and, and I want to hear what you have to say. One aspect, people argue that women are desperate after a certain age, right? I want to hear what you have to say about that. And the other thing too, man, like it seems like women have this obsession with trying to like create this type of man, like taking a man from nothing and building him up. What are your thoughts about that? Um, well, for one, what I've found is a lot of women are desperate from a child. Like, not in the sense of like a twenty one year old, she will pass up on guys because she has time, she has options but she still really, really desires love. And I'm coaching some 21 year olds who it, it just kinda, it's mind boggling to me. I'm like, you have your whole life ahead of you. Why are you dealing with this guy? Like, why are you letting him drag you through the mud? And, and they're talking to me and still allowing the guy to manipulate them, gaslight them and drag them through the mud. I'm like, how can you want a relationship that bad when you're pretty, you take care of yourself, you got a job, like you could have any guy? This is it a situation where I've heard a woman tell me this directly. Cause, uh, uh, it was a young lady that got killed, right? And we were just talking about the people she was around. And um, the, the older lady was saying that a lot of times they don't feel worthy of a good man. And as my brother would say, they avoid good men and we could break with that break down what that means but it's more work it's more work to have a solid dude and that's easier work mm -hmm. i i think the, the way i look at it is when you have a man when they have a man that's disrespectful when they have a man that's like cutting corners or he's living life on the edge they see that as confidence they see that as strength they see that as bravado so they equate that to him being able to protect, him being able to provide. So they look at the guy who is a grown boy who is lost. They look at him as a man because they're deceived just like the world is deceived in believing in the rappers. Whereas the man who has a nine to five, he probably would wipe the floor with any thug in a fist fight. And he probably is way tougher, way stronger, way more confident, but because he's quiet, because he minds his business, because he goes to work and does what he has to do, he doesn't have the flash. He doesn't grab the attention. So he's looked at as soft, he's looked at as weak. And that's what's killing our society. That's what's killing us as a people, is we don't understand reality and our perception is our reality it's funny when you say that because the the, the thug or the hustle or whatever um no consistent income right very low likelihood that they'll be around either from death or incarceration so the support that you need won't be there 
But on the other side, with the stability going to what we're seeing again, it's seen as boring. But it seems like something shifts as they get older, though. It seems like the lens changes a little bit, not all, some. The stability becomes, or the, yeah, the more stable person becomes more attractive. Mm -hmm. And that's typically, it becomes more attractive in the idea. So every woman in the comments will say, I want somebody stable. But then when I show them somebody stable, they then will say, he's not tall enough. He's not light enough. He's not dark enough. He, I don't, he, he doesn't have a hairline. I don't like beards or he needs to have a beard. Like this is what I'm dealing with every day. Like I'm introducing women to who they say they want in reality. And then they're like, mm, that's not what I want. So it's really, we, we lack as humans connecting the, the word to the real, you know, the, the idea to reality. And it's sad. That's wild. Is that picky out there? It's very picky. I have women that I coach that say, Tony, he must have a strong hairline. And I'm talking to these women in their 40s, and I'm like, men start losing hair at 18. I'm like, I don't have a strong hairline. This spray on, and I'm 39. I'm like, there's, I say a man who has a strong hairline at 45, he was 50 pounds at 19. He just developed late. His, his, his DNA, his genes, he was so late. I'm like, but a man with a typical amount of testosterone, with a normal amount of testosterone, he's not finna have all of this hairline. And they will say something like, I've heard a woman, I've coached a woman, she said he must like classical music. Yeah. And I'm like, why can't you introduce him to classical music? Yeah. Like, why can't that be something y'all explore and learn, and he learns it and grows into it with you? That's a part of a building a relationship. I know, I know I've been out the game so long, and I'm kind of out the loop right but i do hear like when did people become so picky is it the social media is it the online Cause i know the online dating is a big thing now too right mm -hmm. and i my, my i had a friend he, he dates and he was telling me about this uh, obsession with tall men mm -hmm. but if there's not a lot of tall men in society to start with mm -mm, mm -mm. the average height of a man in america is five nine yeah. but most women 90 percent of women that i've talked to and I've had over 2,000 coaching sessions. I may be at like 3,000 now. One-on-one -on -one sessions, they want a man that is six foot tall. So they are asking. So now you have the masses of women asking for a man who is above average because the average height is 5'9". So they're not even talking about 5'10". Like three inches above average. You'd be good looking still. And still be good looking. Some bread in your pocket. And have six <laughs> figures. So West of I call it the six six six. And you end up with a devil on your hand. So uh, I read an article, it's funny, it ties into what you were saying. They were saying um there's a small portion of men that's getting all the women. And it makes sense because the majority of women want this type of men. That's wild, bro. Yep. So what happens to the other brothers out there? That's that forms the red pill. I got you now. That's what forms the red pill. That's what forms MGTOW, men going their own way. That's what forms the manosphere is the overlooked men. It, it's just even when you're looking at like DC Mar Marvel Comics in DC, the overlooked person is who becomes the villain. The, 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 the person that was bullied, that was overlooked, that was mistreated, they go into the basement they create these bionic arms, bionic legs, a huge bomb, and they're finna blow up the world because they have been mistreated. That's what the red pill community is. I will say this, man. I didn't know how privileged, and I say this humbly, right? I didn't know how privileged I was until I started teaching and I was around teenagers again because, um, you know, I, I played sports. I was top 20 playing in the state. You're tall. You have your little look. Never had an issue with the ladies. But I didn't realize how many boys are just fully ignored, like, their entire life. Their parents don't pay them any mind. Females don't pay them no mind. They never got an accomplishment. And that just seems like majority of men. 
Mm-hmm. Yep. It's a sad, lonely reality, you know? It is sad, man. And that's the thing. It's like <clears throat> women have to understand that. Like we need mothers to understand that. We need fathers to understand that. And we need women on the dating market to understand that there's more to a man than his height and his look. And we, our society has done this intentionally. And it's the work of the devil. Because if you can debase the man, demean the man, degrade the man, destroy the man, then the adversary has control over the masses. Because if a man has confidence and he is leading his home, now the world outside, the world out large, the system, they can't have control because that man has control over the minds of his family. He's training them, he's teaching them, he's leading them. But if you break the man, you break the family. So if you feed the women the image that the only man that is worthy of you is a six foot tall man who makes six figures. Who has every option on earth. Who has every option on earth. Now you keep women single because they only get to sleep with those men, not marry those men. They get pregnant by those men and they have a tall son, but they're a single mom. And that man is out spreading himself thin because every single woman wants him. So now you have a strong, independent, single mom who makes money and she's ripe for the picking by the commercialism. They're taking all of her money. She's living paycheck to paycheck. She's still broke even though she makes six figures because she doesn't have a covering. She doesn't have a man that she could put her head together with and they could create a budget and they could build financial stability because she's been sold that the best type of man is this type of man. And all she got from that man is a little bit of sex, but no commitment. And now you have the weak woman who's raising her child. Then you have the, the broken and confused man who's being overlooked and he's yeah, hating yeah, women. Yeah. And then you got the man who thinks he is the man, but it has gone to his head and now he's abusing that power and he's just spreading himself thin and never getting married. And it's, I'm glad I came down here, you know. I'm glad I came down here because, no, a serious thing. It's just like when we break down our situation as black people, we have the internal conflict and we have the outside external, you know, because obviously um, between education, prison, food, and all that. But from a relationship standpoint, the way the thing is set, it builds so much confusion because, as I said, this group of guys who just feel like left out of everything is a very dangerous and toxic group. One, for the message that they're spreading, and also they're not they're not contributing or even interested in contributing to the development of our people. They, they kind of like separated themselves. They don't have that association with the development of black people. That's why it's called MGTOW. Yeah. You heard of that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Men going their own way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what it is. It's a broken man. It's a hurting man. It's an angry man. It's an upset man. And he is now going his own way. And that is toxic for society. That, that is the worst thing that we could do. But that's what a human's response is going to be when they're overlooked, unappreciated, undervalued, disrespected. And so women have done this to them on top of women who look like them have done this to them on top of the system, which is maybe the opposite of them, of complexion or race. So now, the most dangerous man on the face of the planet is an insecure man. Because who shoots up the schools? Who shoots up the churches? Who goes to the grocery store and takes all these lives? Insecure men, overlooked men, undervalued men, disrespected men. Now. Ironically, most of those are white males. We don't see as many black males in that space. But so here these males are doing this to typically another race a lot of times and then sometimes to their own, but they're doing it to this group of people and it's a one-off event where they've taken X amount of lives. 
it actually becomes different with black men where, because it's consistent and it's permeating very deep into our own culture and we're destroying from the inside. What do you think about this, man? I, uh, I know there's a lot of work with regards to uh, focusing on adults. I'm not big on converting adults to tell you the truth, right? Whether it's food or just life. I feel that uh, uh, the resources and energy should be put uh, towards all youth, specifically black boys, because I feel that if you can teach them self-worth, I think if they understand the system and even understand why women treat them that way, they won't go into these dark places. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You get what I'm saying? And yep. they really work on themselves because it's kind of rough if you think about it. If you, you know, you struggle reading, you really can't earn, mm -hmm. you look a certain way. Mm -hmm. you know you're not really progressive then on top of that you can't get a lady mm -hmm. it's a rough pill to swallow mm -hmm. and i think we need to prevent them from get, even getting in that spot mm -hmm. and i think like a lot of the i'm not sure how to do i'm still trying to figure out how to do it or assist mm -hmm. but i think a lot of resource needs to be put in developing these young boys to just have that that grit that self-worth that vision and understand the system because i think a lot of people have a frustration because they don't understand the system that they're in and how mm -hmm. to operate in it you just and you saying that you just gave me a vision because you know i got six offices in this office but i also have next door which is this same size and now because you just said that i'm going to utilize that space next door to have saturday or sunday classes for black boys and have a PowerPoint presentation helping them understand the system, helping them understand themselves, helping them understand what they're going up against so that they can start to develop confidence. Because one of the things that men don't realize is that you could be five foot four, but if you confident, you could get any woman. You could be five, six. If you confident, you, you don't have to make six figures. If you confident, and you got a vision, you got a dream, you got ambition, you could get that woman to believe in your dream and your vision and your ambition. But the thing is, is we lack confidence. So now you you unconfident and you're under six foot tall. You're unconfident and you're under six figures a year. So now it becomes this thing to where self-defeatism, you, you just don't believe in yourself. So now you create a self-fulfilling prophecy that you're unworthy and that you can't get a woman because you lack the confidence. And there's a, before we before we end this segment here, uh, this conversation, right? There's another thing we need to touch on. Like, there's this notion amongst women, like this Louis Vuitton bag gonna hold them at night and talk to them and listen to their problems and give them guidance and all that, you know? And I think that this capitalism has corrupted their minds so much. All right, I understand women have been suppressed and I know it's like they're getting this opportunity some argue that they're trying to give the rough treatment to men that they receive, but the thing is out of hand. And I think back to what we said earlier, women don't understand the reality of black men in this environment. And they're using the white standard of manhood for black men, but majority of black men are not in that position to replicate that. Uh -huh, uh -huh. And by doing so, they're single when they necessarily don't have to be single. They could be with a very good man and build and live a great life. Uh -huh. Yep, and that's the thing is like a lot of women are being programmed and they don't realize that that is the trick of the enemy to program the woman to have unrealistic expectations. That's the term. Say that again. Say unrealistic that again. expectations for a man in their life, not realizing that the purpose of a woman is to partner with a man and to build with a man and a woman actually becomes a catalyst in a man's life just as that man becomes a catalyst in the woman's life. But women are being programmed that they need to come into a ready-made situation, not understanding that is not how men operate by allowing anybody to come into our castle, our palace that we have built on our own. The only people who eat is the people who worked. And so what women have to understand is that they have to pick a man of character who is in process building, who has ambition, who is driven, whether he's at 30,000, but driven towards 300,000, or whether he's at 300,000, driven towards three million because 
a man could make six figures in New York and be broke. He could make six figures in Florida and be broke, make six figures in California and be broke. And so he still has to have vision. He still has to have ambition. But here's the thing. We have a poverty mindset. So, so many men and women have a poverty mindset, and that's why it's so many women who believe a Rolls Royce or a Mercedes Benz even or a Louis Vuitton is going to solve all their problems and worries. They believe a four-bedroom house is going to kill all their pain. They believe that having their children in private school is going to take away all the problems, not realizing that the only thing that brings stability is character. And in that Zig Ziglar said this, no amount of money can buy character, but character can make you any amount of money. And so I'm going on 17 years of marriage and I've been developing my character the whole time, still developing my character. And last month in November, just being transparent, I gave my wife about $10,000 for her to buy whatever she wants, to spend on whatever she wants. Outside of the house budget, well, this is the same woman who was frying ramen noodles in the pan for us. And so imagine right now a single woman who is single because she feels she has to be, but it's really because she's overlooking good men because they don't qualify in other areas like their height, or their look, or their weight, or whatever it may be. Imagine that woman being told, hey, if you could be married right now and financially stable, and on top of financial stability, you even have a splurge account where you just get to bless other people and live, you know, help your family, or buy what you've been wanting to buy, and it's peace in your home. Would you accept that? she will say yes. But then the question is, well, this man, he's a reformed player. He used to be a womanizer, but now he's a man of God. Mm, I don't know. He's also under six foot tall. Mm, he also doesn't have a good hairline. He looks 10 years older because his hair is thinning in the middle. Mm. So when I don't have my barber clean me up and spray the spray on, I look 10 years older. <laughs> and my wife teased me about that, but she loved me. I put, I've gained 40 pounds since we met. She loved me and I'm two inches to two and a half inches under six foot tall. But yet women will look at me and say that I'm a standard. I've seen thousands of comments over the years that say, Tony, I want a man just like you. And then I said, no, you don't, because you're walking right past him every day. I'm a former womanizer. I'm a former toxic man. I'm under six foot tall. So you actually don't want a man like me, but you actually don't want to do what my wife did. She saw my heart. She saw my purpose. She saw my ambition. And so because you think, because you're older than my wife was when she met me, you feel that doesn't apply to you. But it does. Because a man becomes more of a man with a woman. Facts. And that's what we have to understand, that it takes teamwork. That you got to be able to look and say, does this person have qualities that I do not have. And if they have those qualities, now does this person have the foundation that I have, meaning the belief system? Do we believe in the same God? Do we believe in the same family structure? Do we believe in the same financial beliefs or system? If you have the foundation, now you can build together. And instead, we're looking at preferences. What's the height? What's the weight? What's the income? What's the complexion? What's the smile? What's the hands? What's the feet? What's the fashion? 
we're looking at preferences. And that's why we got way more single people than we should have because they don't realize they're under the programming of the devil. Because the goal of the devil is not unity. The goal of the adversary is division. So the goal of the system is to have a bunch of single men and women who are addicted to consuming food and material to make the system richer. So as blacks, we spend trillions. We spend trillions of dollars on consumerism when we should be finding a piece of land with the money that we've spent on Louis Vuitton and Gucci, we should be finding a piece of land and farming. But instead, we're buying pesticides and GMO and all of this stuff to the trillions, and we're buying designer to the trillions. And guess what I found out? What I found out about the designer is that the Chinese are selling the designer clothes the exact same quality, the exact same thing for five to fifteen dollars that we're paying four hundred and fifty to five thousand dollars for. And I have seen it, felt the quality, and I'm like, you have got to be kidding me. Every person I know paid four hundred and fifty dollars for this shirt. And this shirt comes from China and you paid five dollars for it and it actually feels better than the four hundred and fifty dollar shirt that all of the rappers are paying but people don't realize that and but there's a large section of people who do realize it and they have it and they own it and they're promoting it on Instagram as the real thing so then they have people who don't know about what China is doing going broke to buy the real thing, not realizing that they were shown the fake thing. And the same thing with the jewelry. The obsession with jewelry in the black culture. I made a necklace from China out of lab diamonds. You cannot tell the difference. And I paid $1,800 for this necklace. For this same necklace, you know what my jeweler told me that he would sell it to me for? 60000 and this is what's, this is where black wealth is going. If rappers would grow up and realize that jewelry does not make them more money, that we are not buying their album because they have on a half a million dollars worth of jewelry. And if they would take that money that they have given this Middle Eastern man to make his family rich who doesn't even wear the jewelry, and go rebuild their community, they could create generational wealth and their lineage will never be broke. They literally will have money forever because just on what they spend on jewelry, they could own a whole block. But we are so concerned with looking a certain way for people who do not care, who cannot help us, and would step over us if we were lying in the street bleeding instead of taking that money and building for our community. What tips would you give to people trying to get in the business and in business? Because I just feel that it's very, there's a misunderstanding about the realities of business, uh, the fluctuations of business, um, and the discipline you need to have a successful business, right? So as a man that started and grew his business, can you share with the viewers in regards to the, the realistic expectations you should have when you start a business? The first realistic expectation you should have when you start a business is to know that financial stability is only a word. That that is a concept, but no business is financially stable, that you have to have the integrity and the work ethic and the character. So for me, what I, what I first had to realize what I had to do is I had to clean up my lifestyle. 
So in my life, in my life, I don't get drunk. I don't get high. I don't gamble. I don't curse. I don't lie. I don't cheat on my wife. So by me cleaning up my lifestyle, save a lot of bread. <laughs> it it it, it not only saves money, but it produces clarity. So because I'm not self-medicated, because I'm not drunk and high, because I'm not having to hide and lie and sneak, I have complete clarity. So I've been able to create 20 different companies and build over 70 streams of income because my brain is operating at its highest capacity because I don't have to think about when a mistress is going to text me and my wife is going to catch it. I don't have to battle through being drunk or being high and feeling lethargic. So I'm able to build business through clarity. And so I create ideas. So on Tony Gaskins Academy, everything that I know is on TonyGaskinsAcademy.com. And that online system has earned me millions of dollars. And all I'm doing is teaching what life has taught me. And I've written 20 books. But on top of writing those books, I write books for other people. And I charge $10,000 to ghost write a book. So I could make $50,000 just by writing five books in a year. I write my books in five days because. <laughs> He's like a, a rapper. <laughs> so yeah, like, <laughs> yeah. I write my books in five <laughs> days. That's, that's, that's equivalent to <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I charge $10,000 to ghost write a book and I write my clients books in three days. So I have the ability and the clarity and the mental capacity to write 52 books a year for other people. So just off that one gift, I can earn $520,000 a year. But the going rate for ghost writing is 20,000 to 125,000. So I'm charging a poor man's wage for my gift. And the other thing with business is people look without instead of looking within. So the reason why people's business fails is because it's built on a trend. It's a franchise. It's something that's popular online when your gifts never die. Your gifts live with you and your gifts can outlive you if you have given your gift to the world. So for me, my whole business is purpose-based. So I earn a living from online courses, one-on-one -on -one coaching, executive coaching, like having a client sign up for a whole year for 10,000, uh, ghost writing, author consulting, uh, group coaching, sharing my wisdom on YouTube. So right now, if I go to YouTube, I think I looked this morning, it says that I've earned $33,000 from YouTube ad revenue, because they put ads on your videos for people who don't know, over the last 28 days. Now, imagine telling a person, you could make $20,000 a month sharing your wisdom online. So since 2019, when I started YouTube, like seriously, I haven't made less than $20,000 in a month. And all I'm doing is sharing the wisdom that God has given me. Now, what business can I go out and make 20 grand a month profit with no overhead, 100% profit? because I'm shooting the videos on my cell phone with no editing. So I'm shooting the video while I'm driving, just holding the camera, I'm looking at the road, and I'm talking. But it's wisdom from God. And so I can never go broke from that unless they shut it down, they change it, but I've built the audience. So then I could take my audience and move to my own platform. And it's dependent upon my gift, my sacrifice, my obedience, not the trend of real estate, not the trend of the stock market, not the trend of the health food industry or the fitness industry. 
it's not a franchise, it's me. So I'm able to take my gifts and create a business which also will create generational wealth. So I can buy real estate, but I'm not beholden to real estate because real estate can lose you everything. Although people get rich with it, a lot of people go poor with it as well because they got in it and they weren't rich and they got over leveraged and then the market crashes like it's getting ready to do. Find yourself in problems. Exactly. And then can't get out of it because not having the financial literacy or the resiliency to be able to come out of it, now you're bankrupt, you're broke, and you're back to square one. But the whole time, you overlooked your natural gifts. Um, that clarity and natural gifts, I'm, I'm very glad you shared that, right? Also, too, can you talk about this? I'm not sure if you noticed this. People want to look like they own a business more than doing good in the business. Exactly. I think it like flops out your finances. You know? It really does. I'll tell you a little secret. A lot of people don't realize this, but a lot of people, they'll write in, and I never tell people this, but they'll write in to me, and whenever they write in, 90% of the time, they're talking to me. But if they write into my booking, there's a name on my booking. If they write into my support, there's a name on support. If they write into my advice email, there's a name on that email. So they will think that I have three salary staff, and 90% of the time they're talking to me. All right, we know how to go already. The, the, the other 10% of the time, they're talking to my wife or like an intern. But in all these years of business, which I started my first company in 2007 or 2008, I've never had a salary or full-time employee. And I've built to over three, three and a half million people online and multiple streams of income and multiple businesses, and I work alone. I got on Oprah and Tyra Banks by myself with no publicist. I've never paid a publicist a dollar. I've never paid a social media manager to build my social media a dollar. And a lot of times people will look at a brand that is big and say, oh, he must have 10 people working for him because the next man who has a brand my size has 10 people working for him. But it's because he's more focused on looking like a boss than actually being a boss. When business is not about building a business that's bigger than you, business is about building something that you know how to be the janitor and you know how to be the CEO because it's about your business. And you can pass that business down to your children, but they also need to know how to be the janitor and be the CEO. A lot of times when we build business that's bigger than us, we're building it not for necessity, but because of ego. I was just about to say that, continue. Go ahead. And we build it out of ego, and whatever ego gains, ego will lose. So I don't believe in having a business that I gotta have a million staff. I believe in having a business where I create the system so that if the system changes, it's because I changed it. So I don't use funnels. I don't use click funnels. I don't use lead pages. I don't use anything that I don't fully understand and that I can't work myself. So that I'm never dependent upon paying a consultant to do anything in my business. I build all my websites with no tech knowledge. So I use software that costs me $99 a month but earns me, my core software costs $99 a month, so $1,200 a year, and it earns me a minimum of $300,000 a year. So I'm turning $1,200 investment to $300,000 in a year because it's software that is plug and play. It's already made, and I don't have to have coding knowledge or any type of real computer knowledge. I click around, templates there, and all I'm doing is shooting my video on my cell phone or on a camera like yours, and then I'm uploading it to the system. And then all I have to do outside of that is use social media, which is free, and be consistent and post every day. Social media needs me. So they will put me in their algorithm because I'm showing them that I want to be a business partner and I'm going to be consistent. So because I'm showing them commitment, they show me commitment. 
They make me wealthy, I make them wealthy. And so it's a partnership, and that's what people don't understand. So this whole thing cost me zero dollars because the people don't care that my site is TonyGaskinsAcademy.com. I could use the same system that I'm using for free, zero dollars a month. It just would be Tony Gaskins Academy dot their company dot com. The people wouldn't care because they would understand. Oh, that's the name of the software. Oh, let me use the software. And all they're doing is clicking a link. So here for zero dollars, I could build a multi-million dollar business by using free social media and free software that needs me to drive people to their software. But yet we're going out and we're getting huge business loans. We're hiring three, four staff. We're getting a 20,000 square foot warehouse. We're ordering $50,000 worth of t-shirts from China. And then we're in $100,000 of debt. In a pressure situation. And then trying to go sell something. I wanted to ask, did your uh, exposure to your father being a pastor, because at the end of the day, a pastor is a business person, did that help you with uh, your approach to business? It didn't because I didn't, my father had a very small church. Oh, I got you, I got you. What helped me with my approach to business is the stability that my father brought and the expectation of survival, the expectation of blessings. It was a mindset more so. And so because I was given stability from my father and I was given everything I needed as a child, it conditioned my mind to know and understand that there is a way possible to be comfortable and stable and blessed. And so that sent me into business to say, all I've known by having good parents, all I've known in my life is success. Even though they work regular everyday jobs, it was stable for me as a child. So that taught me it's possible. Now let me use what my generation has access to, to use my gifts. And so seeing that desire, like my father opening his own church showed me that Oh, you can have your own. You can do your own thing. So at 22 years old, I went to the great creation, Google. And I'm like, they have this thing where you could just type in what you're looking for. So I typed in how to publish a book. And then a company came up called Arthur House. And I'm like, oh, they publish your books. And then I sat down and I wrote a book at 22. And then I published that book. Then I said, okay, well, how am I going to market this book? Well, they have a thing called MySpace, and they have a thing called Facebook. So I'm going to get on there and just add friends, but have my book plastered, and I'm going to market the book. Now they have a thing called business cards and a thing called flyers. So I'm going to go to the flyer printer who prints all the club flyers, and instead of passing out club flyers like the club promoters who are promoting lasciviousness and time-wasting, I'm going to use their same printer but I'm gonna print out business cards for my book. And I'm gonna go to the mall right behind the club promoters and I'm gonna give everybody a card with my book on it so that they could go buy my book. And then instead of going to the club to pick up women, I'm going to the party promoter and I'm asking him, can I set up a table with my books in the club? And I'm launching my book in the club where everybody's at and I'm selling them for $15. So that's what I did when I got started and how I started to build my brand. I was literally in the streets because social media wasn't a big thing. So I was in the streets. And this was two years before Steve Harvey wrote Act Like a Lady, Think Like a Man. And it was five years before any other relationship coach. And so it was from a passion, a purpose, a will, and a desire. There was no blueprint for money in it. And that's what people don't understand. If you operate from within, it's going to make you wealthy. If you operate from without, like you looking around, 
you're going to always be chasing. I heard you once say, let a man's character be his currency, right? Can you please explain what you mean when you say that? Let a man's character be his currency. The reason why I created that phrase is because of the focus that women put on money. And what I wanted them to understand is that based on a man's character, like for example, there's this comedian who Forbes said he made 80 million in a year, but he cheated on his wife. And then there's me who doesn't make that amount of money, but I'm faithful to my wife. But yet, I earn enough money that my wife can have anything and do anything. So if you ask a woman, would you rather have 80 million and be cheated on, or would you rather have everything you want and need and have a faithful man? She gonna choose a faithful man if she have any sense. If she's not broken, if she's not a sex worker, she gonna choose a faithful man and we're financially stable or whatever that means. Our bills are paid. I can have everything I need and, and what I want. And that's why I created that because as I said earlier, I learned it from Zig Ziglar when I was changing my life. I was listening to podcasts all day and I heard him say that no amount of money can buy character, but character can make you any amount of money. So because of the character that I developed, it got my family out of poverty. And it got it to the point to where my 16 year old, he wants to play soccer in Europe. Well, I got a response from a club in Europe on Monday. Today is Thursday, right? I booked a flight Monday for us to fly to Manchester, England tomorrow. So now my 16 year old can go meet in person a European club with less than a week's notice because of the character that his father developed. He gets to go realize his dream or at least look it in the eye and see if it's possible because of the character that his father developed when his very father was selling drugs when he was born and changed his life. And when he came out of the intensive care unit, he was living in an apartment that was $800 a month that was in a bad area. And, and it was a two bedroom apartment. So you know how cheap that was, because two bedrooms for 800, that's where he came into. But because of the character that was developed, now he has everything that he needs and he gets to pursue his dreams. And so I got a response to the email because of the character that I developed. If the guy couldn't look me up online, they don't accept submissions. They have to scout you. But he responded to me because he could see I've done something with my life. And I got other responses from other clubs. And I reached out. The highest level of soccer is the Premier League. Well, the number two team in the Premier League, one of their star players, follows me on Instagram. So when we go over there, my son and I are also flying to meet that, that player because that player says he is a huge fan of my work. So that's why I say let a man's character be his currency. What is it worth for essentially your son to be able to meet LeBron James and get inspiration. We can't put a price on that. But if LeBron does that for a man, that means, which my son has had experiences like that, meeting some of the top athletes in the world because of the character that his father developed. And so that's what I want men to understand and also women to understand, and also the youth who see this, because there's going to be some teenagers who see this, that follow me and follow you. Character is the currency. 
because there are a lot of rich men who are flat broke. And there are a lot of broke men who are very rich. And it's just a matter of time before the rich man with no character becomes broke. I don't want to say names, but, but we, see them, we see them in the rap industry. We see it in the rap industry. Rich men, no character, about to be broke. We see it in the actor industry, rich men. We see it in the, in the music industry, the R&B, rich, but now broke because of no character. But how many times we also see men who were broke but have character become rich. And so if we could get beyond the minuscule mindset that believes $70,000 a year is money or 100K a year is money. Meaning, if women can get beyond and even men get beyond thinking that because you have 100K a year, you're somebody and realize that you could have 20,000 a year, like what I used to earn, I used to earn $20,000 a year working 40 hours a week at a job. And you can have that 20000 and become a millionaire with character. And if people understand that, and if people will understand that anything worth having, it takes time, and it's a process. A lot of time. <laughs> right. And you can enjoy the process and stop being so consumed and focused on having luxury or having complete convenience and be okay with the grind. Be okay with the time. Be okay with the growth. Be okay being financially broke, but rich in character, rich in mindset, rich in work ethic, and know that it is a universal law that you cannot have a rich mind and have broke pockets forever. You cannot have a rich character and have broke pockets forever. That's universal law. So I believe the majority of people are too, ma too immature and selfish to get married, right? Do you think the majority of people have the intellectual capability, spiritual strength, emotional maturity, and selflessness to make a marriage work? Everyone has it in them, but there are very few people who are feeding it and believing it and accepting it. So in our society, majority of people are single because they're selfish. And in order to be in a marriage, you got to be selfless. And so men and women alike that are single, majority of them, there's a group who are single and healthy and they're ready, but they haven't met their match. But the majority of them that I meet, they're too immature, they're too selfish, and they're too caught up in fantasy and unrealistic expectations. Like, I, I meet men, <clears throat> I meet men who are five foot six, and they want a 5'10 woman who looks like a model, a runway model. It's not realistic, because a 5'10 woman doesn't want to be towering over her man. And that's just human nature. But because this man has been hurt from being 5'6", he wants this tall woman for validation. Because if he could get this tall woman, that means he's somebody. That means he's a boss. That means he's him. So he wants this tall woman who would be out of his league because of ego. Not because he just likes her. Not because they get along great. 
and I'll meet women who are 250 pounds and they want a man who is 150 pounds. Sorry to cut you. When did this start? I, I feel like I didn't grow up around this delusion. Like I didn't grow up around where you had an obese person with the expectation and truly believing that uh, another person who's not obese would be attracted to him. And I'm not trying to fight down. I'm not trying to get at people. I'm just saying in regards to like that compatibility. Mm -hmm. I think like wh where did it get so delusional in our society where it's like people feel in their heart that they're deserving of a certain type of person when they don't match. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's all out of insecurity, ego, and greed. So what happens is they've allowed the media to make them feel entitled without them even putting in the work. So now they feel entitled to someone of another body composition who has put in the work to have that body composition, but they don't want to walk 30 minutes a day. They don't want to have an eating window. They don't want to sacrifice. We're, we're not talking about the health issues where people have a thyroid issue and all of that. We're just talking about choices, lifestyle choices. They don't want to make the lifestyle choices to have a better body composition, a better outlook on life, more confidence. Instead, they're operating from ego and arrogance, which comes from insecurity and weakness. Confidence comes from humility. And so they want someone, and men and women alike, I've had large men tell me they want a little woman, meaning overweight men say they want a small, petite woman. And I'm like, what makes you think this little petite woman wants you who are overweight on top of her for the rest of her life and vice versa? But it's entitlement, it's selfishness. But the through line is seeking validation, seeking approval. So when we feel less than, we feel unworthy in society, we want to seek this approval. So if we can get what we aren't, that means we're valued, we're qualified, because we are afraid of our reflection. When we look in the mirror, we don't like what we see. So we don't want a person who is a reflection of us because that's ugly to us. We want someone who is who we aspire to be because that validates us. But not realizing who we aspire to be does not want us because they've put in the work or they've lived a different life or they've gone through different things that they don't value our complacency or our, or nor do they respect our entitlement or our selfishness. And this is something that people get mad about. They don't want to hear it. Oh, you, you body shaming. Oh, you height shaming. Oh, you just focusing on the material, or just the looks, the external, when it's not even about that. From, from my perspective, it's about liking who likes you because of that being your reflection, because of them being a person who has put in the equal amount of work that you've put in. The more work you put in, the more you get from life. The more sacrifice you make, the more success you have. I got that sign on my wall that says sacrifice comes before success, even in the dictionary. That's my quote that somehow went viral and made it with, these, with this company thing. But I believe in that because if you're not willing to sacrifice your ego, your selfishness, your unrealistic expectations, you're going to suffer. And so that's what's happening in our society is we, because of technology, because of social media, because of online dating, which is all technology, we are lazy, complacent, 
entitled, selfish, and delusional. There are a lot of talks about sexless marriages, right? Um, do you feel a sexless, a sexless marriage can uh, last? <laughs> the reason I'm asking you, when I hear about sexless marriages, is only done in a certain context, and they leave out so many different aspects. Why mm -hmm. is a sexless marriage? Exactly. Yes, it can last because there are several reasons. And, and, and when we say sexless, what they really mean, well, in some marriages, it's literally sexless, sexless. like, like, they don't like, have any sex like at all. maybe once a year, yeah. twice a year. My wife told me she saw some ladies post that on TikTok that they've had sex twice a year. And in a healthy marriage, you might have sex four times a month, yeah. which would be equivalent of once a week, even two times a month. Because especially when you got them kids, when yeah. you have kids, yeah, you hustling. You have kids. You moving around. But the key is communication. So I seen this lady. She was like a sex therapist or something, and she was saying that she makes time to have sex every day with her husband because if she doesn't, they lose connection, and their marriage starts to suffer. And I'm like, that's a miserable marriage to be in. That you have to go through physical pain. Because when you have a lot of sex, you, your body start to hurt because you're using body parts. Thanks. And that's just, you know, it's not, it's not healthy, it's not smart. And science, scientific study shows that there are no health benefits to having more than one orgasm a week. And if that one orgasm is even healthy, it just gives you a release from your brain of oxytocin but if you have communication, me and my wife, we talked about this, and I was like, look, we real busy, like we moving around, like we don't even get a long time until midnight because our oldest son is in one of the toughest academic schools in the country, and so he's doing homework after soccer practice. We get home from soccer practice at 10 p.m. He's doing homework <laughs> before practice and after practice. He doesn't really finish homework before midnight. And some nights, he doesn't finish until 2 a.m. Yeah. to maintain his 4.6 GPA, and he takes four AP classes, advanced placement classes, which he'll get college credit when he passes the AP test, which he's taking today and tomorrow. Well, when my wife has been up from 4.30 a.m., and then she's up till midnight, that means she's only sleeping four and a half hours. Who feels like having real on four hours of sleep? If he's up till two, she's only sleeping two hours. Who feels like that? So she just drinking coffee, trying to get through the day because we are parents to busy children. She gets up because she wants to have a routine for them in the morning. So she gets up and she gets them ready and all of that makes breakfast and drives them to school. Me, I'm an entrepreneur. So I may stay up late so that she could go to sleep before me. So that if I'm moving around in my sleep or I start to snore, it'll wake her up because we had a premature baby. Our first son was premature and ever since then, ever since then she wakes up at the drop of a pen. So any noise I make in my sleep, it wakes her up. So I'll stay up later than her so she can sleep two or three hours before I go to sleep. And then I'll go to sleep. But while I'm up, I'm working. And I'm building business. And I'm creating plans and th projects. And so the next day, if I have to get up early, I'm tired too. So by definition of the comedians and definition of the rappers and definition of the sexologists and all of that, I'm in a sexless marriage. Even though we are intimate, it's not at the rate that society tells you you should be. And guess what? We're doing better than ever. Because, of relate, because what I found in a healthy marriage is that sex is a plus, not a priority. And if you make sex your priority, good luck. Good luck. Because life will change, schedules will change, health will change, age will change. I seen a man have a stroke and his wife started cheating on him because sex was the priority. 
not communication, not relationship. So me and my wife, we had this talk after seeing like this viral TikTok about sex. And she said, but I don't feel like our connection is weakening when we're not, you know, bumping and grinding all the time. I said, you know what? I feel the exact same way. I said, but I thought I was crazy because this is what all of these uh, white females keep saying. It's mostly white females that I see pushing this sex thing. I don't really hear it as much from black women. Um, I mostly hear it from white women as, who are sex therapists, sexologists. But I know from my experience that demographic of women are also far more promiscuous than the average black woman. And, but that narrative is going out and it's spreading like crazy to where people feel like their marriage is broken if they're not bumping and grinding every week. And, and not even every week, but every day or every other day. When we've had spells in our marriage to where we don't have sex for three weeks. It's probably even been a month before. And also what I learned is my wife, she fell in the gym one time I don't know if she was on the Stairmaster or the treadmill doing backwards stuff. She was competing. Um, she was bodybuilding, not like the muscular one, but the bikini division. And she fell and she hit her tailbone. And when she hit her tailbone, it, it was a little small cut just from the friction. Well, it got infected. She had to have surgery. So she had to have surgery. She was out for 12 weeks no sex. If sex was my priority, I would have dove into nasty stuff on the phone. I would have cheated on her. But because that wasn't a priority, we still was able to go on like nothing happened. Build even stronger. So true love making is not physical. It's mental. The largest sexual organ is the brain. Not the vagina or the penis. The largest sexual organ is the brain. And what we have to learn how to do is make love to the mind, not to the body. If we learn how to make love to the mind, making love to the body is the simplest thing you'll ever do. For those unaware to the game that you're given, please break down to the viewers what you mean by making love to the mind. Making love to the mind is conversation, communication, quality time the more you spend with a person talking and building and expressing that is making love sex is actually fulfilling lust not making love that's why people can have what they call casual sex that's why people can have sex on the first night when there's no love that's why people have sex with prostitutes and strippers and gigolos because there's no love. Sex is physical. Love is emotional. Sex is the fulfillment, meaning completing the act. It doesn't have to be fulfilling. It might not be fulfilling in that sense of the word, but you are fulfilling a act, a physical act that is intended to reproduce. So it is a spiritual act. It is not intended solely for pleasure. It's intended to complete, to procreate the human race. And people have made that their priority and they've become a slave to a process that is solely for reproduction because it's not always pleasurable for the man nor is it always pleasurable for the woman. It is to reproduce. And if the mind has been made love to, then it is pleasurable. But sex in itself, in and of itself, is not pleasurable. That's why we have the R word. If a man, R word, the woman, R A, you know the word I'm talking about, is that pleasurable? No, it's not pleasurable, even though they are doing the very act. But because her mind is not in it, 
and she did not authorize it. She did not approve it. She did not say it was okay. It is the most humiliating experience that she has in her life. So the act of sex is not a act of pleasure. The act, what produces pleasure is the mind, which is the largest sexual organ, being on board and saying, I want this. So what people will find out is when they truly fall in love and they have made love to the mind, when they come together with their spouse, it won't last, when they get intimate, intercourse, it won't last more than 30 seconds to three minutes, maybe five minutes, before both have had a release and are satisfied. And the reason why is because the mind was completely engaged and they had made love to the mind. So the body is ready for the release. But if the mind is not in it, that's why you see in that industry of people into that stuff, watching other people do that, that's why this notion of Minuteman has been made to be a bad thing. Because if you have no connection to this person, if you have no love to, with this person, if you have not made love to each other's mind, a minute of that act is going to do nothing for you. But if you are in love with this person, that minute could feel like a lifetime. That minute could feel like a piece of eternity because that minute may be all you have right before bed, right before work, right before whatever. But if you are in love with that person, that minute is one of the most fulfilling minutes you've ever had in your life. But if you are doing this casually and you're doing this with somebody you don't love, that minute is miserable. That minute was a waste of time. Are you kidding me? That's all? That's it? That three minutes, that five minutes, that ten minutes. Studies show that a woman on average takes 13 to 40 minutes to have a release on average. How many men going 13 to 40 minutes? That's not realistic. That also shows you that the act itself is not about a release that the release is not about, the act is not about the release because the reproduction has happened far before the release. What we need to reproduce and create human life happens far before a woman's release unless she's completely in love and completely stimulated mentally. Her release will come a lot earlier. And this is what people don't understand about sex and this is why we have become slaves to sex. And this is why we live in a perverted society that is becoming incapable of real relationship and healthy relationship and long lasting relationship because we are giving power to something that wasn't intended to have this type of power over our minds and over our lives and our marriages.